Dr. Hudson earned his BS in agribusiness from West Texas A&M University and his MS and PhD degrees in agricultural and applied economics from Texas Tech University. He has been a professor at Mississippi State and a Farm Foundation Fellow. Hudson's research interests include agricultural policy and trade, economic development, marketing and consumer demand, and behavioral economics. He participates in the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute Consortium, producing annual baseline projections for cotton for the group. Hudson is a past president of the Southern Agricultural Economics Association. Thank you for being with us today, Darren Hudson. Thanks for, uh, for showing up, and um, I'm sorry that I won't have better news than, than it, maybe the El Nino guy, you know, the weather guy talked about wet, uh, being wet, and that's a good thing. Um, because right now, Dan I mentioned a minute ago, he said, you know, the oil industry, the oil prices have fallen so much that maybe agriculture will leap up above uh, oil in terms of uh, state productivity, but the reality is, is ag prices aren't helping us out in, in that equation. Um, and so I want to throw my uh, colleagues under the bus here, Mark Welch and, and John Robinson. This is actually all their fault. Uh, so any questions that you have about uh, where prices are, you can bring it up with them. I'm just the bearer of bad news. Uh, now, just kidding. It, uh, we, we share a lot of information, Mark and, uh, and John and I. Uh, for our uh, sort of regional outlook meetings that we go to. Uh, and so I really appreciate their effort uh, in, in providing a lot of information here. Uh, we we sort of try to share our thoughts uh, on the data because as most of you know, economics is a very imperfect science. Uh, we do make weathermen look good. Um, so uh, that, that's a bonus. We're, we're so inaccurate that the weather guys look better than we are. But I want to start out um, before I delve into prices and data and everything else, is, is to talk about sort of some general uh, thoughts on uh, the factors that are influencing where we are and where we're likely to go over the next 12 uh, to 24 months. First of all, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of lately is a stronger U.S. dollar. Um, the dollar has appreciated, or uh, should we say, the yuan depreciated, so the Chinese government purposely depreciated yuan relative to the U.S. dollar. Um, and then you have sort of macroeconomic appreciations that are occurring, the U.S. dollar versus uh, the Brazilian real. Um, the, if, if anybody's watching South America, it's collapsing uh, before our eyes. Brazil is, the Brazil financial situation is falling apart. Um, the U.S. dollar versus the Australian dollar. Um, a number of these currencies, the yen, um, the U.S. dollar is strengthening. Um, we, we look at it, and it's sort of interesting because we think about, well, we're $18 trillion in debt. We, you know, we sort of have no direction as an economy. Uh, we've got a lot of political, uh, regulatory instability, those sorts of things. But the reality is, is we're the least worst of, of the options that investors have. Uh, so there's still a lot of continued investment in the U.S. dollar, uh, which has led to some strength uh, in, in, that, uh, in that relationship. For agriculture, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, we're in markets that are very export oriented, our competitiveness uh, globally is largely influenced by the values, relative values of those currencies. So as the US dollar appreciates relative to our competitors, what we're going to see is pressure on US exports. And notice that I pointed out some major competitors for us. Okay, so Brazil, uh, they've had uh, pretty substantial currency depreciation. Soybean, cotton export. Australia has currency depreciation. Uh, sorghum and, and cotton exports. Um, and yuan, the Chinese yuan uh, depreciating, what that means is that um, all of our products are more expensive than the internal products, or relatively more expensive than the internal products. So imports into China decline. So we need to watch where we head over the next uh, 12 to 18 months in terms of currency values. If we continue to see strengthening of the U.S. dollar, expect to see more pressure on U.S. exports as a result. Second part of that is a slower Chinese economy. So, you know, we've, we've heard about, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the great uh, stock market crash in China that occurred. 
uh, you know, over a trillion dollars lost in, you know, in a day or so. Um, in, in percentage terms, it, you know, mirrored or looked a lot like uh, the 29 crash in the United States. Uh, now, when we say slower economic growth in China, we have to keep that in, in relative terms. Um, when we see an economic downturn in Europe and the United States, we're talking about negative GDP growth. In China, they're talking about going from 10 or 11 percent to 5 percent. Um, so that's a slowdown for China. Now, we'll see what, how that plays out, if that continues. But a slower economy in China means slower uh, economic growth globally. It also means less imports of raw products into China to be produced into goods and services um, that are then re-exported. Uh, we've got European economic weakness. And you know, uh, we can't discount the fact of a million Syrian refugees entering into Europe having no impact on the economic conditions in Europe. Um, it's going to strain the government coffers in Germany, uh, these other countries that are trying to cope with um, all of these, uh, the influx of these refugees. Um, and so it could have a, a pretty substantial impact on their ability to import uh, and their level of economic growth as they try to absorb those. Um, you know, we're, we're having talks about how many refugees are we going to accept in the U.S. 100,000 refugees into the U.S. is probably not going to have a substantial impact on us, but certainly a million in Europe is going to have an impact on European countries. There's some, in, in, we've heard some talk about increasing interest rates in the United States. Um, you know, there's some pressure on the Federal Reserve to, hey, we need to go ahead and get out in front of uh, you know, these increasing wage rates and some of these things that we're seeing in, in the data. Uh, but there's a lot of pressure on them not to do that as well. There's really no indication at this point that, you know, sort of the economic terminology, the velocity of money has increased. Um, the velocity of money is the, the number of times or the speed at which it turns over in the economy. It's been very, very slow since the Great Recession, and that's part of the reason why we haven't seen a lot of economic growth or inflation on top of all this uh, extra money that we have setting in the economy. So there's not a lot of impetus. The Fed is really reluctant to go out and, and raise interest rates. But we know one thing is that interest rates and commodity prices are inversely related. So if interest rates rise, it will put pressure on commodity prices to go down even further than where they are. So we don't really want them necessarily to go be too aggressive about raising interest rates yet. Uh, but I don't think they will. I think uh, there's just too much pressure for them not to touch it for at least another 6 to 12 months. So all those factors, when we put them together, mean continued pressure on U.S. commodity prices. That's not uh, particularly uh, heartening given the, where we are in U.S. commodity prices at this point. Now, when I say that there's continued pressure, I don't mean that we necessarily will see lower uh, commodity prices. It's that there's a lot of pressure on keeping those prices down rather than having an upside potential uh, to those prices. So some questions I think that we need to think about. So what is going to be the path of the U.S. dollar? Uh, where are we going to head um, in terms of exchange rates? From a more micro uh, perspective is uh, how many capital are we going to have on feet? Uh, we'll look at those numbers. But in terms of grain prices, um, that is an influence on where we're likely to head in terms of corn, sorghum, and wheat. Uh, what's going to be the path of input prices? Uh, we certainly haven't seen, you know, as commodity prices have come down, we haven't seen a lot of softening of, of input prices yet. Some of them have come down, but not all of them. Diesel is obviously cheaper than it was uh, a few years ago, but some of our uh, more crucial inputs are not. And then you get into cotton and some of these other things where we're actually seeing increases in input costs because of the complement of the inputs we're having to put in additional, uh, either additional uh, herbicides or additional labor and, and tractor time in terms of cultivation. So we need to be careful about thinking about what the path of, of these input costs are going to be. The, the question that I think producers need to ask themselves going into this next spring is, can I cash flow at whatever I think the anticipated insurance price is going to be? Because that's likely to be the floor of your market you're not going to see a lot of upside potential uh, in, in a lot of these commodity markets. And so we've got to examine whether or not we think we can cash flow at whatever the insurance may guarantee us if we have a disaster. So 
Uh, we want to, uh, you know, this again, I think the, the story I've been telling uh, most groups that I've talked to is that the challenge is not, uh, I mean, it is obviously the prices and, and the input costs, but the challenge is, is that we have become uh, relatively uh, satisfied with not doing a lot of management, financial and, and economic management. We sort of said, okay, we've got these great commodity programs, they, they protect us at certain levels, um, we've got great marketing pools or whatever, we don't have to worry about prices because they've been high enough for a while. And so right now, what we're having to do is transa transition back into a world where we have to do some pretty aggressive marketing, we have to do some uh, pretty aggressive financial management in terms of our cost of production in order to make these things cash flow. Uh, this last thing I'll, I'll just kind of throw out here because we don't know what the answer is. Are there going to be changes to the cotton program? Uh, the House Act Committee has taken up a number of these issues and looking at uh, ways that they might be able to modify or, or engage in some activities. One of those is that cotton seed is, under the law, is technically a lesser oil seed. Um, and so as, as a lesser oil seed should be eligible. Uh, for ARC or PLC payments, uh, oil seed payments. Um, the Secretary of Agriculture has the authorization to do that. They're lobbying pretty hard to try to get the Secretary to go ahead and push that button so that that would be an extra revenue stream. It's not going to be a lot, but you know, another five to seven to ten dollars an acre uh, makes a difference uh, when you're trying to cash flow. Um, and then looking at some of the other provisions in terms of insurance, as you most, most of you know, stacks is available. Uh, but only 11% of U.S. producers actually purchase the stacks or an SCO policy on their cotton. So uh, the participation rate is very low. There's some questions about why the participation rate is pretty low. But obviously, uh, it's not a cheap product, and then there's no price guarantee in that other than whatever the insurance price is uh, set in February, and it wasn't that great this year. So why pay a lot of money to protect a loss, uh, essentially? So. There's some questions about participation that we need to address uh, or that if the, the House Act Committee is interested in looking at. All right, I'm going to turn quickly to the grain outlook. I'm going to start with grain because it's, um, uh, of the two, is the relatively better story to tell. Uh, I probably should finish with it to leave a better taste in your mouth, but, you know, whatever. I, I didn't do it that way. Uh, the good news in grain is if we look at total grain consumption uh, in this graph, per capita grain consumption has continued to rise globally. Um, that's a good thing because we have a lot of grain. Uh, we're producing a lot of grain. It needs a home, um, and consumers are continuing to consume more. Um, a lot of this is driven by the fact that China and some of the developing countries, their incomes have gone up, and so they've been able to purchase a more varied diet, which has included a lot of imported grains. And so that, that trend has really helped us in terms of the offtake in our markets, as we'll see in a minute. Well, one of the things that we need to be concerned about, see at the end, that thing kind of peaks off? Well, that is uh, maybe indicative of sort of a change in direction of grain consumption. If you're looking at China, for example, if they've got stagnated incomes and, and reduced economic growth, how much more grain are they actually going to consume? Okay, so I think we need to be wary of that, at the, that because we continue to be very good at producing grains. Uh, we're, you guys are great. You're doing a great job producing grain, but we don't need as much of it necessarily. And this is shown here in this graph. If we look at corn, what this, um, what these graphs show are the days on hand uh, in terms of stocks. So in corn, we've got right now about 72 days uh, of use on hand, which is slightly below the 20-year average. So that's a somewhat sort of static uh, signal in the market. It's not. It's neither bullish nor bearish. Uh, it's, it's not. There's, the stocks aren't driving prices down significantly, but they're certainly not helping us in terms of, of trying to get a price back up. Well, if you compare that to wheat, we've got 113 days on average, which is above the 20-year average. And so you can see what's happening or has happened to the wheat market as well. So some of this is macroeconomic, some of it is stock-driven. But wheat is certainly not going to uh, dissipate those stocks very quickly. And in corn, you know, we're going into what may be the largest crop ever in the United States. So that is also not a very strong price signal um, for this year or for next year. Now you compare that to cotton. 
We have 330 days of use on hand globally in cotton. Um, you know, it's no wonder we can't get out of the 62 cent range. So, you know, we're not going to bleed those stocks off anytime soon. They're not going away. Um, I'll talk about some scenarios when, we, when I get to cotton. Well, going back to the sort of the price situation in corn, you can see where we have been over time. This, uh, this yellow line represents the average in the biofuel era. So since about 2005, the average corn price has been $4.66 a bushel. Well, you can see we're down here around $3.60, $3.50, depending on you know, what day of the week you're looking at the market. The, at $3.65, we're, we're now approaching back to that range where we were in what we call the world trade era before biofuels. And part of this is because we've built significant stocks in corn and ethanol has grown, I'll show you in a minute, but feed use has, has really hammered us. That's what, and we really need uh, feed use to pick back up. So this, what, uh, this graph represents, um, this blue line represents the ethanol offtake of corn. The red line represents the feed use of corn. And then we have exports and, and in these stocks. Well, you can see what's happened, what happened over the last few years in terms of feed use. But that has now turned around a little bit. And so we, we've actually got more cattle on feed, and that's helping us. That's why I asked you know, the question, are we going to continue increasing cattle numbers? Ethanol is sort of flattened out. Now, ethanol, interestingly, has gotten to the point now where, with exports, it's basically economically self-sufficient at current prices with the subsidy. You take away the subsidy, it's no longer self-sufficient. But it's closer than it was back in 2005. Now we're, you know, within the margin of error, we might make it, some plants would make it without the subsidy, some wouldn't. But exports certainly have enhanced the ability of ethanol uh, plants to make money at, at current prices. Uh, shockingly, one of our biggest export customers is Brazil, who's also one of the world's largest producers of ethanol. But there's ships trading in the night. We, we take some, some Brazilian ethanol into our market as well, depending on timing. Uh, but the feed use issue is the one that we've got to be concerned about. Um, it, as, as grain producers, that's where the bread and butter has been and where it's going to continue to be. The problem is, is that cattle is on a downward trend. For 30 years, we have the cycle of peaks and troughs. But the trend has been down in terms of cattle numbers and cattle consumption in the United States, or beef consumption in the United States. So even if we recover our cattle numbers uh, out of this cycle, this drought cycle that we've been into, the likelihood that we're going to go above or much above that trend, that downward trend, is so we're going to end up consuming less beef and needing to produce less beef than we did 10 years ago the last time we had this cycle, um, which means that that number isn't going to necessarily recover up here. Uh, so we're, we need alternative uses and, and we need to look at the economics uh, of growing corn. Now if you're a sorghum producer, that, that's really been the bright side of the last 12 months in the grain market. Now that's kind of fallen apart on this last uh, little bit when uh, China decided, well, we're, are we going to import or are we not going to import? But you can see what happened. The green line represents exports of sorghum. What's happened the last couple of years is, is, is the uh, sorghum market has essentially inverted relative to corn. So a lot of places, uh, sorghum trades at a, uh, a premium to corn, especially in these southern areas where we've got competition between ethanol, feed use, and exports. Um, so, uh, you know, we're really concerned about this one. China actually, you know, it's not... I know everybody in this room that grows sorghum thinks it's a great thing, but myself as an economist, I look at that and I'm a little worried about China buying everything that we produce because what happens next year when they don't and we've lost the market to Mexico or we've lost the market to somewhere else that's being filled in by Argentina or somebody uh, else and, uh, and is, is selling it to them cheaper than we can. So, you know, there's a double-edged sword with all these exports, but Sorghum has definitely been a bright side for us down here in terms of an alternative to cotton. Uh, and then if you didn't have enough water for corn, it's, it's uh, put that option out there. Um, term, in terms of wheat price, it looks very much the same as, as corn. You know, we've had this sort of upward trend over time in price, but we're way down uh, in price this year relative to where we have been in the last several years, the average over the last several years. Um, We've done a pretty good job at producing wheat. We've had a lot less export uh, potential 
than we've had in the past. We've had a number of those kinds of issues. But we're certainly seeing weakness in the wheat market, and that's not going to go away. So you see here, uh, they, these are the exports in wheat, and this is what's happened over time. That's what I'm talking about. The export markets have shrunk in wheat uh, relative to domestic use, which has risen slightly, but now we're back up in this, you know, at the top end of this uh, average um, in terms of stocks, and so that's putting some pressure. So we don't have the exports to sort of bail us out when we have a big crop. Uh, we, we tend to build stocks, and then that puts pressure on price. So wheat markets, I think, are, are again, not looking great in terms of an alternative uh, over the next 12 months. Now, this is what I was talking about uh, a minute ago when I said, hey, uh, what happens when we, when we price things in other currencies? Well, the blue line is the price of wheat in U.S. dollars. The green line is the price of wheat in Japanese yen. So this is what Japan sees. When they go to buy U.S. wheat, they see this. So they turn around to Australia, which has a cheaper, uh, their, their currency is cheaper relative to the U.S. dollar, and it's down, it's down here. So they go, oh, well, I'm not going to buy U.S. wheat, I'm going to buy Australian wheat. And so that's the, that's the impact of exchange rates. And we're seeing that across the board on all commodities in most of, most of our major export markets. Our, the U.S. dollar is, is not helping us at all. Okay, turning attention to cotton real quick. Um, you know, I don't want to depress you too much, so uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to dwell on it. But cotton has the inverse of the, of the grain issue. Per capita use of grains have gone up, which has supported these growing markets that we've had at higher price levels. But what's happened since the recession, of course, we all know what, you know, we get up here and price, the price of cotton goes to $2 a pound, and all of a sudden people quit buying cotton. Well, we, we've gone back down here. Now, this thing down here, notice that we're not far off the average of per capita cotton use. So, and of course we have more people now, so total cotton use is higher than it has been in the past. But we've lost a lot of market share to man-made fibers, and there's a reason for that. One was the, the really high price of cotton. The second is there's an excess capacity globally in man-made fiber production. So China has about 35% excess capacity. They can turn on a, a, a mill anytime they want to and ramp up production if cotton prices get out of whack. But the other thing is that the engineers have gotten pretty good at making man-made fibers act like natural fiber. So the closer we get, the closer those engineers and chemists get to having these, these, these uh, man-made fibers mimic natural fibers in the way that they're, they're cooling properties and all that, Pretty soon people go, well, I don't need cotton. It's, I can produce this other stuff cheaper. Uh, you know, it's man-made fiber cheaper. And it's a myth that people have that they think that polyester is related to oil price. It's not. Okay? Polyester is made from byproducts of the oil refining process. So they don't really, the, the price of oil doesn't really impact the price of polyester that much. Um, Okay, so if we look at our current balance sheet, um, this is uh, pre-WASD. WASD didn't help us any. The, the last WASD report didn't really help us any. Changed the numbers slightly, but, but the, the qualitative conclusions are still the same. Um, first of all, our production number here at around 13 million bales, and you give or take based on the WASD, we got a number of factors. Cumulative heat units, which we've had, we've been getting pretty good heat units. Um, sort of the uh, warm maturation period in September and October. Do we have enough, not only to get the yield, but then to get the maturation of the, of the fiber to make it sellable product? Um, date of the first freeze, okay, so, you know, I'm sure we'll have, yeah, everybody has their little office pool on what the date of the first freeze is. You know, we're all hoping for like November 15th, not, you know, Halloween. Uh, that would be a good thing. So if any of those variables change, you can go for anywhere from 13 to 16 million bales based on, on what the yield is and the number of acres that we have planted. Abandonment's going to be pretty low. Okay, so, you know, uh, WASD, I think, still over, overestimated 11%. Um, you know, I think our, our current, if we look at our current numbers, it's 6.4% on the high plains. So, I mean, you know, we're 50% we're of the cotton production. I don't know how WASD gets to 11%, but whatever. Um, and then, obviously, the Chinese stock policy is going to impact these, this number down here in terms of exports. Do we hit our 10 million bill uh, export or not? Okay, that's, that's kind of the key. 
Um, and so, you know, if you look at current year, uh, the bottom line on terms of stocks, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about some mild stock reduction here uh, relative to the past. Um, it's historically price supporting, but it's not, it's not strong enough probably to, to save us from 62 cents. So if we look at uh, where we are in terms of, this is the price uh, for this year. These are, this is the average under these, these years had smaller carryover. These years had stable carryover, and these years had large carryover. So we're basically trading sideways, which is consistent with the stable carryover market. Now we're at a lower level than this up here because of China, because of the stocks that are sitting out there globally. So our stocks are relatively stable. Our price has been, if you, I know everybody's watched the price, we've been in this 62 to 67, 68 cent range for a long time. Just been sideways trading, you know the gamblers on on uh, on the ice exchange just playing with each other, going up and down a cent and a half here and there, trying to make money. But the real move in cotton is not out of that range. So you know we're talking about a, a sort of a stable carryover situation. Well, if we're talking about stable carryover, what happens between the December 16 and the December 15 price? They look a lot like each other, right? Because if there's nothing that's going to change us between where we are in December 15 for the December 15 crop versus the December 16 crop, there's no reason for the market to trade any differently across those two those two uh, contracts. And so, in fact, uh, the December 16 contract up to now looks a lot like the December 15 contract, trading in that same basic sideways range. And there's really no reason for us to get out of that range uh, as of yet. Now, I talked about China, trying to wrap this up pretty quick. We did some simulations looking at some, the way China might uh, draw down its stocks and sort of the impact on U.S. prices as a result of that. Well, their stated policy when they started out um, of selling a million tons this year is, is about a 9% year-over-year reduction. 10% was our initial assumption. We just ran. So it's close to this 10% assumption. So this is the, the Chinese ending stocks. Stock starting at about um, 65 million bales here, ending up at about 30 million bales in 10 years. So cutting it in half, getting back to a sort of long-term historical standard of Chinese stocks of about 20, 20 to 30 million bales. Well, that's that green scenario. So if, you know, if China were to aggressively pursue a stock drawdown, look what happens to U.S. price. It just craters our market. Why? Because they. They're basically taking no imports into China, and so everything that we've got to sell has to find a home, and the only way to get it to move is to lower the price. Well, you know, on average, that over that period, <coughs> you're talking about an average U.S. price of 56 cents as a result of Chinese uh, stock liquidation policy. But if we go back, we look at what's happened this summer is China set out with a million ton goal. Uh, and they sold 8,700 tons basically up front and have not really sold a lot over the rest of the summer. Uh, part of that's quality, part of it that it's high price, and part of it is that the mills don't need that much cotton. They're still importing U.S. cotton, but they're importing high quality U.S. cotton to blend with this low quality cotton that's coming out of the reserve in order to meet contract specification. But they're certainly not moving a massive amount of cotton out of the reserve into the market. So what that gives us then, if you look at the at the uh, the current sales out of the Chinese reserve, that puts us more at this five percent annual reduction uh, number, which means that we're talking about an average price of closer to sixty cents instead of fifty six. Average U.S. farm price. Okay? That's not the average futures price. That's the average U.S. farm price. Now. It could be higher than that, could be lower than that, depending on, on sort of the individual market scenarios that we talk about. But the reality is, is that the Chinese stocks aren't really suppressing or depressing the price any further than where we already are, based on our current, current supply and demand. So I wouldn't expect, in other words, a lot of change. Uh, if China can't move that cotton out any faster than they are right now, you wouldn't expect a lot of change. And China is still importing somewhere around um, Six, uh, six to eight million bales uh, a year in terms of its WTO requirements. So assuming that they follow their WTO requirements, which is a big, big assumption, 
Um, they, they're still going to import somewhere around 6 million bales, and most of that's going to come from the U.S. Okay, wrap this up real quick. Um, so nothing really indicates any major changes in grain or cotton market. I would say if you step back away and look at the market fundamentals and the other factors that are out there, there's more upside potential in grain markets than there is in cotton markets. Uh, we're at tighter stock levels on those grains, so a, you know, a small hiccup in supply uh, can, can bring that up. Uh, you know, even a modest increase in demand, uh, a modest increase in catalog feed numbers, any of those sort of factors can really influence that grain market much more so than the cotton market. Cotton market's just kind of stuck um, uh, where it's at. Um, of course, the El Nino is going to likely improve the soil moisture. So if we get the forecasted rainfall that we heard about a minute ago, it's likely going to increase our soil moisture, which is certainly going to lower abandonment next year and certainly going to improve the yields next year. But depending on the timing of when that rainfall starts, it may actually hurt us this year. So if it starts early enough and we've still got cotton in the field, then what we're going to do is see quality degradation, which means that we, we already have a glut of cheap, nasty, uh, poor quality cotton in the market. Um, the last thing we need to do is add another 4 million bales of that in it. So, uh, you know, yeah, I want it to rain. I don't want it to rain until we get the cotton out of the field. That would be the, the ideal, but, you know, we don't have any control over that. And finally, again, the key to success, I think, over the next 12 to 24 months is going to be managing your input costs. Uh, and then the other thing is optimize your crop insurance. Most people haven't thought about this. Uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you how many of you did yield exclusion. A couple of you did, not many did yield exclusion. Did you know that you could take yield exclusion, uh, decrease your coverage level, have the same pounds or bushels of coverage at a lower price than you did the previous year? Because if you go from a 70% coverage level to a 50% coverage level in your insurance your premium subsidy goes up. If, you're, if your yield exclusion bumps your yield up high enough that you back off to that 50 or 55 or whatever percent coverage to get the same pounds or the same bushels, the per unit cost of that insurance is actually lower. That's not a lot, but $4 an acre is $4 an acre when you're trying to cash flow in, in this environment. So don't be afraid to challenge your crop insurance agent about ways to maximize your coverage level or your, your, your risk protection at a cheaper cost. Uh, it's their job, um, you know, push them. It, it's okay. So don't, you know, leave no stone unturned, I think, is, is the sort of the thought process here. We've got to find every cent or every dollar per acre that we can in order to make this work. All right, I'll stop there. Are there any questions? That's a severely depression. Boy, yeah. So, so uh, 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 good question. The, fir the first question is if, if we do end up with the cotton seed element in, in the program, what is likely to be the WTO response to that? Uh, and the second question was uh, when are people going to become internally consistent and criticize all products the same way? Um, so the, the, the answer to the first question is it's kind of unclear Nobody said anything at this point as to how the WTO might react. It's certainly within the bounds of the way the law was written that that, that cotton seed be treated as a minor oil seed. Um, so there's, uh, there's very little precedent in terms of the WTO taking action against the United States on including that in that program because it is an oil seed. It's just, it's a co-product with the fiber, and so there's really nothing, there's nothing that's going on there. And the other thing is, is that the oil seed program is decoupled anyway. So it, 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 it's not dependent on your current production of, of cotton seed, it's dependent on the historical, based on the formula that they come up with for how many pounds of seed, for how many pounds of wind, that's right. So it's, it's, it, it, it's just like the corn program is, it's decoupled. So I don't think there's a lot of risk at that. Now, I, I say that, they, you, know, they, you know, lawyers will find all kinds of tricks. A, a report came out the other day slamming the WTO, I mean, the cotton program by some international organization is highly subsidizing and distorting. Um, and I, I still haven't figured out how they got to that conclusion, so we're, we're working on, on a write-up. There's a contingent or a niche in that market 
who favor organic whatever, vegetables, uh, cotton, whatever. They don't seem to see the lack of consistency in the fact that polyester is made from a petroleum product, which has all these environmental sort of side effects in terms of the, the effluents and the chemicals and, and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, that's, I think that's something that we as an industry need to try to challenge uh, by, by looking. I think some of the work that's already been done on the carbon footprint of cotton and then developing that same idea of a carbon footprint on the same shirt at, that's made from polyester would be very educational because we would see that the carbon footprint is much bigger on that polyester shirt than it is on the cotton. I and mean, we know from anecdotal evidence that that's the case. So I think some education and some research to try to push back against that notion that, look, if you want organic cotton, that's fine. But at least be, understand what you're buying and then what you're giving up or if you go to a polyester in, in a critique of some sort of natural production process. Anything else? Darren, yep. looking at the, the PLC on sorghum, and that's based off what the market in your average price? Yes. Is there a way to track that to kind of know when your PLC would kick in on sorghum? Is there a way to know that? It's not as good in sorghum as it is in other crops because you, 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 can, you can see that. Now, there's the USDA formulation, but it's the data for the formulation that becomes an issue. Uh, I, I know that uh, that actually has been an issue raised with USDA at, at publishing a moving average, marketing year average price for the crops so that as you go through the crop year, you can get a sense for what that marketing year average price is. But it, there's a formulation, it's just, the, it, you know, I can tell you what the formula is, but it's the data to actually do the, the calculation as you move through time it, that makes it difficult. But there are people that are actually raising that issue because producers, especially, you know, when we have these overlapping programs like marketing loan gains in one year and PLC payments in the next, and, and so you're worried about hitting that cap and how much you're going to pay back and that sort of thing. And so it, 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 it would be helpful to producers to be able to see that to know, well, I don't need to take that payment because I've already taken this one and I don't want to have to pay that back. Or, you know, there's a little bit of reconciliation going on at USDA, uh, but, but it would be better if it was transparent and public. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much.